Hey guys, welcome to Loudly Creative again today, June 13, 2014. It's Friday, sunny day in Miami. What a beautiful day to be out. Either or, today we're going to have a special on the news considering two institutions and the crisis of the South Asian bloc as well as the Russia initiative towards Ukraine. How two organizations such as the OTAN and the IMF have actively participated in their engagements of recuperating peace during the regions. And not only this, but increasing their influence to better the possibilities of growth within the whole block of that two continental or dualistic continental relations. Starting off with an article in El País about the OTAN on concerns from the elevated highest world security uh, issue since the Berlin Wall fall back in the 80s. Uh, the organization has re well, actually, back in the 80s, basically the 90s, because it was in 1989, the organization, the OTAN, has refocused their attention investment from Afghanistan to Crimea, Russia, and the separatist differences among its regions, mainly Ukraine, bringing the Atlantic allegiance back to its root investment of super. Uh, vising and uh, super investment actually take away the word super and just consider investment on the supervision through the immediate concern of the bordering nations that find risk at hand General Secretary of International Unit Andres Fogg Rasmussen within the OTAN displays the following investments to be activated immediately, strategically increase of troop placements within the eastern countries of Europe, these which may fall on probable risk are considered with priority. The assignation would be balanced out throughout safer countries where stronger linkages between their national sustainability may allow them to send off existing troops from the organization towards needed regions of support. Allied forces have also invested on air coverage, we're adding to foot wave on land. Denmark, Denmark has included six F-16 combat jets. The UK and France have added eight, and the USA supports the motion with 20 air fighters. The declarations state that air is well on its way to balance supervisions of its terrain, land and water are now going to move ahead. Statistics show that economic crisis has reduced government spending on national security for the OTAN. This reduction has been seen mostly on their manpower within a statistical measure of 6 million active members in 1990 to the actual reference of their accountability within their human capital to defend or attack of 3.6 million. It's almost half just shy by, I would say, 15 to 20 percent of a positive non-half, 80 percent less. Last measured on 2010, the objective is to formalize corporate initiative onto the neighboring states, where actually the union might raise its burden on the separatist movements within the intervention of their participation. Nation coalition would lead to the solidification of the binding unions overall, since the treaty signed in 1997 with the Russian government, peace and cooperation has been guaranteed between the OTAN and that country. However, advisors of political and social strategy within military buildup on defense believe with certainty that isolating a non-negotiating aggressor of regional laws and rights might help reactivate measures to persuade their actions. Later on, Another article trying to bind up on the inferences of the reality of organizational institutions of great power such as the OTAN and the IMF. We have the opposite measures on the need to invest during uh, merging economies or economies that take advantage of their position in power to persuade furthering power of their corrupted state, not necessarily to take away from the people, but to try to give more to the people on the premise of what they already have gained through them. It is a very delicate subject, but the article is about the Southeastern Asian bloc, that would be basically 
China and the territories that fight for their sovereign uh, buildup on security within the oppression of the Chinese territories to take away that uh, right, and also the Russian uh, linkages of the North Korean and South Korean nations, mostly the acts of investment on defense they have taken as an initiative to solidify their power. While Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel in the United States proposed that a reduction of soldiers for this country take action towards the investment of a reduction that would actually measure the count on 450,000 soldiers, this amount could bring the measure to its lowest since 1940. Peking announced, on the contrary, an increase of their military target, which budgets to 96 billion euros, that's around 123 million dollars, net increment of 12.2% in relation to the previous year, and it's almost parallel, or a little over their GDP net gain in relation to their past year production. As of this, Russia and Japan also invest on expansion of their armament units. Russia, for example, has considered of higher value to raise the spending from public collections towards a cumulative investment of their military structure from 2011 towards 2020 or 2020 the nation intends investing 503 billion euros to renovate 70% of their armament unit however in the true management of their assets in this sector of their sovereign basics Corruption, bad investments, and lack of organization depreciates the true potential of the overwhelming supply offered for defense and attack within that nation. This is an analyst uh, speaking here. His name is Sam Perlow Freeman, representing the SIPRI, or the Institution for Investigation on Peace, established in Estocolm, where he basically denounces the fact that investing so much money to renovate whatever you lacked through corruptive instances to take good care of may only lead to the consideration that if reapplied notions of the previous cycle take place, the amount of money, which is a 503 or half a trillion euros investment, could be used for many other purposes rather than the concentration of the centralized notions on militaries militarized power to gain more control of a region. Either or, it's an issue of democratical instances like we've seen before. Every nation has its resources and must develop their strategy to protect what they believe to hold true. However, in China, and as another perspective, this time on the territorial conflicts within its regions, in economics we know that resources are capital, human resources are very qualified to be obtained as one of the highest measures because of their capacity to produce and also territorial geographical measures. This is why China is concerned not only with the amount of people they can handle or manage through production but also the territory which they might consider is there around the regions. The issue relies on the parallel need to grow on all fields of their non-lackings when it comes to domestic and exterior demand. This is mostly tied to their ambitions on power for the future. Having a possible upper hand on reaction, if the United States allows submission through territorial disputes, they defend constantly. Taiwan, Malaysia, and Singapore, which have been tempted to counteract through China's initiative of offensive partaking with what they believe is theirs, have allowed no laws to hold them back. Withstanding the cost of less GDP on their other needs, they have considered the growing treaty of inactive uh, peace from China's eminent uh, impact over the taking of what is theirs historically and reduce their spending towards the fence tightly to possible their needs on defense actuality. Altogether, they will spend 340 billion 
dollars to fertilize their strength on defense. Then again, three hundred forty billion dollars, Taiwan, Malaysia, and Singapore. These are countries that don't have as much resources as Russia and still consider it a demand of their need to satisfy the protection from an aggressor such as China. So here we can see how each democracy must adapt to unjust and just measures within their regions of resources. In another article, and this time to finish off, we touch on the basis and the premises of the most significant credit line institution of the world, the IMF, this time implementing strict controls towards Ukraine in exchange for the rescue and their recuperation possibility. A line of credit has been demanded for 19 billion euros to affirm certain measures of the new governing party in Ukraine. Separatist movements, social discontent, and previous government corruptive transactions has led the nation to spike its negative slope on growth in present standings of its now. If the nation was an enterprise, it is broke already. The deficit is on the $26 billion mark. This is half of the country's actual $50 billion budget to invest on release of relief. Inflation hits the 13% mark on a mean percentual, generating a marginal error of its take in 15% of barons along its trade, basically fluctuating between 12 and 14%. The leading from the leading institution of IMF and other institutions with resources for buildups and reconstruction needs not to evade the fact that Ukraine still will suffer from the consequence of its active trades offs. The adverse conditions which they must face are not only going to be mended by the credit lines, but on their efficiency to cut back on spending. The relocation of the resources, mendings, and the capacity they hold to transparently adapt to the slope's weight. We must remember that this slope is negative at its stance for its instability at hands. 24,000 employees will be let go within the public administration. Higher taxation on luxury goods with will hit hardly the vice consumption of the product held in leisures, tobacco and alcohol mainly. A policy stretching no real control and capital exiting the nation shall be worked upon to improve the likeliness and sustaining confidence within domestic investors. Finally, the energy sector with the needs to reform shall hold activity withstanding its own weight and the responsible links that generate tit interest towards the political abstraction lived. A hard hit for the nation is that and the following as well. Now they will receive a bill increase on gas of around 80% from Russia, passing the bill to the people during a micro and macro economical disaster of its partaking. As of not less, more than political insecurity leads to weak consumption, financial burden on banks to fight insecurity, and federal policy to be strictly tense on taxation plus returns to the land. Social, cultural, political, economical catastrophe at hands of the Ukrainian new administration. Social subsidiaries become eminent as the government will leak their acquired funds from international lenders to ease certain families through the crisis. Exchange rate of the dollar must be liberalized, postulates the IMF as an option to allow the US dollar to dictate reality of its worth, something the previous president restricted. While he corruptly wasted, spent, and stole more than 130 billion dollars. If, as all the previous was not enough to deal with, Ukraine is at war at borders, separatist movements, and insurgencies. It has lost economical regions such as Crimea and Donbass, with Donetsk and Lungask as highly producing components of its sectorial GDP overall measure within each year, surpassing and critical social discontent within its domestic market is also a reality. This finds misleading politics to disrupt the true beliefs on any possible improvement, but as of now, the IMF keeps them alive with hope. This has been Loudly Creative, and I hope you enjoyed today's summary on the reality of what we can find through the media of the Asian blocks 
separatist movement of the territorial demands from their legal bindings to protect their sovereignties, the Russian crisis on that same separatist union where the demands of the EU were pushing Ukraine to find alternatives of its relations to its past, and the OTAN and IMF reactions, responses, and overall growth during the years. Thank you for joining us. We'll have more tomorrow.